I've been interested in magic squares since my early teens. And if I can, I'd like to share some of that fascination with you today. Because it's a story of magic and myth and mystery and imagination and mathematics. But I'm going to try and keep the math to a minimum. And I'll also stop there with the alliteration. And it's a story that goes back perhaps 4,000 years. And it all begins with turtles. According to Chinese legend, the great Yu, who was the founder of the Jia dynasty around 2000 BC, devised this pattern, which he saw on the back of a giant tortoise as it emerged from the flood of the river Lo. And this is called the Lo Shu, which means the river writing. And if you count the dots in each segment of the picture, you'll see there are numbers there. 492, 357, 816. And these have very important significance in Chinese religion and magic. One of the uses of this Lo Shu square relates to something called the Steps of Yu, or the Yu Bu. The Taoist priests have a mystic dance step, which is to step forward and then slide the back foot. And that's because Yu himself was lame through all his labors. And if you trace the numbers of that square, from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 and so on, you create that pattern. And the Taoist priests will walk through the temple using that movement from 1 to 2. And by entering the different areas of the temple, each of which has its own particular significance, they believe that they acquire supernatural powers. But this particular square has other interesting symbolic features. You'll note that the odd numbers, the yin numbers, the passive numbers in Chinese philosophy, are in the corners. And the odd numbers, the yang numbers, the active numbers, form a cross in the center. And that has great significance, particularly in feng shui. But the thing about this square that makes it magic is the fact that if you add up the numbers in each row, or the numbers in each column, or the numbers on both diagonals, you get the same total, which is 15. And that's what makes it a magic square. And that's the defining characteristic of a magic square, that the rows, the columns, and the two diagonals will add up to the same number. And that number is called the magic constant. And the number 15 also has symbolic significance in Chinese philosophy, because it's the number of days in each cycle of the Chinese calendar. Now, you can create magic squares for any number of rows and columns, except two. You can't have a two by two magic square, because each number has to be different. So you can't simply write two in each square, because, well, that wouldn't be magic. But you can create magic squares for any higher order that you wish. And using computers, squares have been created for huge numbers of rows and columns. But I want to sh focus on this particular square for a moment. It's a fascinating and extremely important square. It's found in this temple in northern India. It's a Jain temple. And magic squares often appear in buildings, and it seems like they're there as a kind of magical protection to ward off evil. For the same reason throughout history, people would wear magic squares around their necks as amulets, or perhaps they would have them embroidered on their clothes for magical protection, or for healing, or simply for good luck. But this particular square, the Jaina square, also known as the Chautisa Yantra, is particularly interesting. In fact, it's been called diabolic, a diabolic magic square. Not because it's anything to do with the devil, but because it is diabolically intricate and ingenious. Because not only do the rows, the columns, and the diagonals add up to the same total, which in this case is 34, but every two by two grouping within that square adds up to 34. The four corner squares add up to 34. The two diagonal squares in opposite corners add up to 34. In fact, there are 52 
different ways that we can obtain the magic constant from this particular square. It is truly diabolic. It's also called pan magic, or uber magic, or most perfect. It is the most perfect magic square that is possible. So what makes it pan magic? Well, it's all to do with the diagonals. There is a universal feature on the diagonal, which is that if you look at any two numbers which are spaced two apart on either diagonal, they add up to 17, which is exactly half the magic constant. And it's that feature that makes this a pan-magic square. And also they're very interesting design that you can obtain if, again, if you trace the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way through the square, you obtain this quite interesting, complex, not quite symmetrical pattern. Now this square, the Jaina square, as it's called, dates to around a thousand, the year a thousand of the common era, our common era. I want to jump forward now 500 years to this man, Albrecht Dürer famous German artist, who in 1514 created this interesting and enigmatic engraving. It's entitled Melancholia I, or perhaps it's Melancholia I. And this has been the subject of much discussion and debate for many years, and interpretations of the engraving vary widely. But perhaps the most likely explanation is that it's a reference to the first type of melancholia that was identified by the German occultist Cornelius Agrippa. Agrippa talks about melancholia imaginativa, or melancholia of the imagination. And he believed it particularly affected artists. And it was due to a conflict between imagination and reason. And you can see features of that in the, in the engraving. The figure there looks rather forlorn, has wings, is surrounded by various instruments of science. There's a very strange polyhedron in the picture on the left, which actually is unique in art history. It's known as the Dura solid. In the background, there are more imaginative features, perhaps. The sun, the sea, and a rainbow. But I want to draw your attention to the upper right, just below the bell, because there is, yes, a magic square. And there it is. Now, the first thing to notice is that this is not a pan-magic magic square. And we can tell that because we don't have the numbers on the diagonals adding up to 17 if you take numbers that are two apart. So this is not a pan-diagonal, a pan-diagonal, pan-magic square, but it is an interesting square because it has additional features as well as the rows and the columns and the diagonals. The four corner squares will add up to 34, and the four central squares add up to 34. And it does create quite an interesting pattern. Now the question that is begged here, I think, is where did Dürer get this magic square from? And the answer is this man, Cornelius Agrippa, again. But one thing I want to show is that the Dürer square can be made pan-magic very, very easily. If you take the Dürer square and you swap the bottom two rows, and then you swap the right two columns, you obtain this pan-magic square. Because now the two numbers, two apart on the diagonals, do add up to 17 in every case. And so that would produce a pattern whereby you could obtain the magic constant of 34 in these 52 different ways. And also it's interesting, if you have a look at the pattern that it now makes, it's symmetrical about the horizontal midline, perfectly symmetrical. It's a very interesting square. But the one that Dürer published was not pan magic. The one that Agrippa published is also not pan magic. Agrippa was a very famous occultist. He influenced all sorts of people. He influenced Dr. John Dee, the court astrologer and advisor to Elizabeth I, for instance.
for example. And his most famous work is this. It's called Occult Philosophy. And it was published in 1531 originally and then over the next couple of years. But it had circulated privately in manuscript form for many years before that. And it's very likely, and indeed I think it's certain, that Dürer obtained a copy of Agrippa's manuscript and hence he obtained his own square. Because the two squares that Agrippa publishes and the one that Dürer has in his engraving are variations, very simple transformations of each other. If you take Agrippa's 4x4 square that he published and you invert it and then you swap the middle two columns, then you obtain Dürer's square. So why did Dürer do that? Why did he transform Agrippa's square? I think the reason lies in the bottom row. So if you look at Dürer's square, you'll note that the, the two middle numbers are 1514, which is the date of the engraving. There's another interesting question that is begged by this square, and that is, because it's so easily transformed into a pan-magic square, why didn't Agrippa publish it? Did he know of the pan-magic variation? I think he did. And I think he thought that the, the magic was too, just too powerful, too diabolic, and he decided to keep it secret. Now, Agrippa also published other magic squares of different sizes, and he attributes these to the different planets. The 3x3 three three square is attributed to Saturn, and that is exactly the same as the low shoe square that we saw earlier. And the other squares are attributed to the other planets. They were called planets. They were known as planets at the time because this was about 10 years before Copernicus. And it was believed that each of these squares encapsulated the astrological qualities and powers of each of those planets. And they could be used in rituals, for example, to bring down the power of Venus or to bring down the power of the moon. You would use that particular magic square. They were also used to create sigils for the summoning of demons or the invocation of angels using a very specific procedure, which I don't have time to go into. But what I will go into, because you might find this interesting, is how can we create magic squares? One thing to notice is the designs that are traced out by the seven Agrippa squares. And I'd like you to notice the difference between the odd order squares and the even order squares. The odd order squares have a very symmetrical and regular and simple pattern. The even numbered squares are much more irregular in their structure. And that relates to the way that we can construct these magic squares. It's very difficult to construct an even order magic square because they are extremely intricate. The odd order magic squares are actually very easy to construct. And perhaps you'd like to learn how to do it so that you can impress your friends. It makes a nice party trick. It's a very simple method. It came to the West in the 17th century. It's called the Siamese method because it originated in Siam, Thailand as it now is. You start in the middle at the top and then you move up and right. And if you can't move up and right, you move to the end of the row that you would have moved into. So you start with one. You would move out of the square, so you end up going to the other end of that particular row. So two will go there. Three will go there because you go upright. You may move out of the square, so you would then move to the other end of that row. The four would go there. You would go upright, five. The other rule is that if you get stuck, you move down. So you then go down six, up seven, up eight, and so on. And we can carry all the way through using those very simple rules, and we create the magic square, which has a total of 25. And that's something about magic squares. I hope you find them interesting. I hope you enjoy the game. But remember also that magic squares should be respected because they are, after all, magic. Thank you.